Hello, we've got three excellent presentations this morning, and um, we're going to start with Anne-Marie Scott, a piece of illumination enlarged using OER for access and activism in cultural heritage. Thanks. Okay. Anne-Marie. Thanks very much, Francis. Um, this is kind of slightly unusual for me, um, because I'm going to talk quite a lot about something I've done personally, rather than something I've done professionally, or at least professionally in a university context. So hopefully you will um, bear with me and indulge me. Um, but there is a connection, um, and I, I, there is a connection to my professional practice. And I'm, I'm going to make three arguments here, and then hopefully through a personal example, illustrate them a little. Um, and the first is that openly licensed resources have particular properties that make them um, really quite suitable to the, the kind of activist activities I've been involved in. Um, secondly, that engagement with particular open platforms can help with some of the discoverability challenges around openly licensed resources. And the third, and the one that I think I probably feel most passionate about, is that if you invest not just in stuff, but in building literacy and in building capability, um, then you actually can teach a broader range of digital citizenships, digital citizenship skills <laughs> through teaching open skills. Um, so as I said, my story does start in a a university context. Um, I work at the University of Edinburgh. I'm the Deputy Director of Learning, Teaching and Web. And in 2015, um, we ran our first Edit-a-thon. Um, it was a three-day event focused on the story of women in medicine, uh, the story of the Edinburgh Seven. Um, and you can look it up on Wikipedia. There's some excellent pages about it. Um, and it was uh, facilitated by um, the National, uh, well, the Wikimedian in residence at the National Library of Scotland at that point, um, a lovely lady called Ellie Crockford, who's just sitting on the, the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and it, it was the start of our journey towards having our own Wikimedian in residence. But because we're a, a proper research institution and we think about what we do, um, we evaluated the work that we did. We asked Alison Littlejohn from the Open University and some of her colleagues to um, analyse our edit-a-thon activity um, and to help us understand the impact of it. Um, and there, there are a number of pieces of research that have come out of this activity and this, the work that Alison has done and her colleagues. Um, there was a presentation at OER 16 that some of you might have seen. Um, but there, there are a couple of points that I really want to draw out of the, the papers that have um, been published. And the first was from the, the, the first paper that was published, which was looking at the formation of networks of practice and um, social capital through participation in an editathon. And the, the few points that I think are really important that I want to draw out are, firstly, that activity didn't stop when the editathon stopped. We continued to edit, and I was one of the people involved in this editathon on, so I am kind of research subject in here too. We continued to edit even after the activity had stopped. And we did build a network of practice around our editing activities and we communicate with each other, those of us who are involved in that editathon still. Um, and we did consider this activity to be part of our professional development. It was really important to us and it wasn't about the topic that we were studying uh, so much as learning the skills around editing Wikipedia that we, we felt were important. The second thing, and this is a more recent paper, it was published five or six weeks ago now, um, was looking at the process of becoming an editor and the kind of perceived roles and responsibilities of Wikipedia editors. And the key things I think I want to, to pull out of that are that the process of being involved in the editathon really got us into the nuts and bolts of how um, knowledge is created, curated, represented, debated, discussed online. Um, and that, that process of taking responsibility for creating knowledge and thinking about, uh, thinking about that critically um, did, for some people, give them the feeling that editing and creating that knowledge was a form of activism. So telling the stories of the first women, um, women to matriculate in a university in the UK and telling them accurately and fully was a form of, of, um, of, of activism. Um, that's then a lesson which I have um, carried forward. Um, and this is where we turn from the thing I did professionally in work to um, another activity, which I, I actually think it, it's another professional activity. I put two titles for myself on my opening slide. I'm the trustee of a building preservation charity in Edinburgh. Um, and we are the stewards, custodians of a Category A listed building um, called the Mansfield Square Centre. It is uh, an enormous church. 
uh, deconsecrated church and it is absolutely covered in murals by a female artist called Phoebe Anna Traquair. She is really important because she's the first um, professional women artist in Scotland. She's the first member of the Royal Scottish Academy, she admitted as an honorary fellow. Um, She's, she's incredibly important in her own right. And these murals have got other cultural significance around the, the church that the, they were painted for. They say quite a lot about 19th, 19th century thought about religion, and they say quite a lot about the arts and crafts movement. But these aren't the first murals that she painted in Edinburgh. Um, she started her career by painting a very, very small chapel in the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. Um, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children has moved and her murals moved with it and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But these murals were commissioned by um, Patrick Geddes and the Edinburgh Social Union and if you know anything about um, conservation or town planning or interdisciplinary education you may have heard the, the name Patrick Geddes. If you haven't, go and look him up on Wikipedia. Um, and she was asked to paint um, what was a, a converted coal shed, very small space. And the women's committee who, who um, asked for this building to be painted were looking for, I put the quote there, suitable place where the bodies can be left reverently and lovingly for the parents before the burials. This is a very private space. It's a very moving and intimate and difficult space. It's a mortuary chapel in a children's hospital. Um, I, I mentioned the Edinburgh Social Union and the commission. This was one of about 20 public art commissions in the city of Edinburgh. It's the only one still in existence. Um, it is, um, well, it's, it's had quite an interesting story even before we get to this point in time. As I say, it was painted in this very small space in this converted coal shed. And in the early 1890s, the hospital moved and Phoebe herself um, started a petition to move these murals. Uh, they were moved into a much larger, or a, a larger space. And she repainted um, and sort of filled out the blanks around them. So they've had a period of at-risk um, already when the hospitals moved. Um, and we find ourselves again today in the same position. The Sick Children's Hospital in Edinburgh has been sold again. It's been sold to private developers. And so as somebody who has a, a professional and a vested interest in these murals and how they relate to the building that I'm a trustee of and how they relate to the history of the city that I live in, we're faced with two issues that we really need to try and solve. Um, one is that this building isn't accessible. It was never designed to be accessible. So it's massively important artistically, socially, culturally, historically, but you probably shouldn't have access to it. Um, and secondly, it's been sold to a private developer and I think that puts it at risk. They are not necessarily experts or specialists in, in this kind of thing. They're a, a housing development company. And there is a risk that they will lock the door and nobody will ever see it again. <laughs> Um, and so myself and um, a couple of colleagues, um, a couple of friends who care about this sort of thing, another trustee from the Mansfield Queer Trust and a friend from the National Museum of Scotland, I started thinking about this. I started thinking about how to raise awareness. And these are works of visual culture. So if you can't see them, how can we get people to care about them? So we commissioned uh, a friend of my, my friend from the National Museum to um, take a series of photographs for us which we committed to releasing under open licences. That was how we got the permission from NHS Lothian to have access to the building before it was sold, that these photographs would actually be available for them. They could go into Lothian Health Services archive. They could be used by their artists and residents. They could be used by scholars like uh, my, my colleague at the museum and my colleague in the, the Mansfield Traquair Trust. So we made this upfront commitment to open licences. But it gives us something that we can now use to try and raise awareness and I'm just going to run through some of the pictures that we took to try and give you an idea of why it's really important to have this record and why it's so impactful. Because there are a few things we really need to document. The first is this, is, this is a panel from the first mortuary chapel that was moved. And this is a panel from the second mortuary chapel, you know, the, the place where all the murals now are. They're very stylistically different. So this represents a real shift in Phoebe Traquair's own painting at that point in time um, and a shift in her thinking. Um, and so it's important that we, we have, you know, those, that, that history of the murals documented. It's another one of the early panels and you can see just how different they are. Um, there are, there are tropes and, um, 
features that we see in her murals over and again. So if you can see, let's see if I've got a laser pointer, at the back of the mural here in this little vignette is the Liederfoot viaduct in the borders of Scotland. She paints that viaduct in several classical backgrounds in her paintings. We can see some quite interesting ideas, and don't ask me to explain what this means, because I really can't, about mortality in the 19th century. Floating hands, people sleeping in serpents with skulls heads, angels, tongues of fire, snakes. We can also see things about the condition. This is missing paint, conservation paper cracks, more conservation paper, more missing paint, and a test cleaning patch, which shows you how discoloured the, the murals are, and, and actually how vibrant and bright they could be. And without these, it would be incredibly difficult, I think, to tell the story of these murals, to explain why they're important, to explain what they mean to cultural heritage, what they mean to um, you know, artistic heritage, what they mean to thinking about religion and death and mortality in the 19th century. So I said that we committed to releasing them under open licenses, but that's all very well and good, but you've got to think about the problem of um, distribution as well. And the most obvious thing we felt to do, based on my experience in um, those early editathons, was to use um, the Wikicommons platform. So we made all of the images available on Wikicommons. Um, we then used the images to write Wikipedia articles. We inserted the images into existing Wikipedia articles. So this is the, the hospital and uh, Phoebe de Quare's own page. And then we did Google search. And now three of the images are what appear on the front page. And, it, and the article we wrote is the second ranked article. So anybody who hears about this story, who hears about the private development, who even hears those words, is going to be able to type that into Google and find a set of resources that will help them better understand why they're important. And we know this is particularly important in Edinburgh because we know that our local newspaper searches Wikipedia Commons, Wikimedia Commons, and uses images for it to illustrate its um, stories. Because this is a turnip carved by none other than Lorna Campbell sitting in the front. <laughs> <laughs> It's your turnip, uploaded by our Wikimedian in residence, <laughs> randomly picked up by our national newspaper, local newspaper. And they are good at covering the story of this hospital. So I'm trying to put those materials under their nose so that they're really findable. As I kind of rattle through of a, a kind of quick case study example, um, but I really, I hope that I've made the case through kind of sharing my own practice, that if we as institutions invest in the kinds of activities that started this off, the, the Editathon, um, and we nurture those kinds of activities, actually they can have benefits um, that, that move beyond our borders, move beyond the borders of our institution. And again, um, I think that came up in two of the keynotes yesterday about operationalising the knowledge that we get through participating in, in open. Um, and I think I'm probably bang on time, Francis. I'm going to finish there. That was a bit of a speed rattle through it, but I'd be very happy to take any questions. Questions? <laughs> I was just crying. <laughs> but this is what I want. People see these images, and I can tell the story about this place that's yeah. at risk. Yeah. It, it is nothing without these images, yeah. because they're really powerful, because they're... You know, they're a mortuary chapel in a children's actually, hospital. They have real power. As a last case resource, if you're not successful, they're still important. That's, that's our big worry, and I know this is being streamed, so there's certain things I won't say, but yeah. there are times um, in commercial developments when perhaps cost judgments come into play, and yes, these are Category A listed, mm -hmm. and there would be a very big fine if they were damaged. Right, that's good. But, Good well, how big would that fine be relative to the yeah. size of site and profit to be made? Questions? Yes, Martin. <laughs> it's all about Lorna's turnip, really. Lorna's <laughs> 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 turnip. No, I missed a trick. I 
I've been lucky enough, actually, through some of the web governance work that we've been doing in Edinburgh, to have Johnston Press, who are the publishers of The Scotsman, come in and talk about their digital strategy with us as part of helping us frame our digital strategy. Um, and I think understanding how you know, print journalism is grappling with the internet and, and trying to meet them halfway is, is absolutely what it's about. And you know, they, all, they all publish their digital strategies online. These are things you can go and look at. They're all trying to work out how to be digital publishers. Um, and I think, I mean, Johnston Press, I think, are quite enlightened in this space in that they have clocked that Wiki Commons is probably quite a good resource of stuff they can use for free. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can, we can clearly reach out um, to them and push some of this stuff a little further under their nose as well. Um, um, I, um, could I ask you? Does that answer it? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I put the stuff into the Wikimedia project because so many people go there to get their information and because Google privileges it. Um, and it's then a, a spin-off benefit that I also know a couple of companies or you know a couple of publishers will do that. Whether they do that because Google makes it easy for them to do it or whether they do it as a more conscious move, I, I don't know, but yeah. Any other questions? I, I, I could just ask one. You sure can. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but I went to the DCDC conference, Discovering Communities, Discovering Collections, or something like that anyway, and I heard a talk about a sort of infrastructure framework that allowed a sort of virtual presentation of resources across different collections. It was, you know, very technical and probably massively hard to implement. But I wondered whether there was any scope for these not just being picked up by the press through Wikipedia, but other digital collections being able to bring them into you know, in a virtual sense. I think, I think there's a lot of scope for that. There's Lothian Health Services Archive, which is actually yeah. based in my institution's library. Mm. Um, and I would love copies of these to be lodged with mm. them, to mm. sit with the, the archive of the history of, you know, hospitals yeah. in the Lothian. Yeah. So they do need to be with that collection. Mm. Um, yes, they almost certainly can be joined with other collections mm. and materials about art, the arts and crafts. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think there's so many possibilities. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, what I haven't talked about is Wikidata. Um, I have also been working on Wikidata, which is where we can start to do some of the linked data stuff that mm. will, will connect these images with other collections mm. through references to the hospital, through references to the mortuary chapel, mm. to Phoebe Traquair and Patrick Edison. I'm still working on that. Yeah. There's quite a lot to do in that yeah. space. But putting structured data behind yeah. it to give it um, a bit more power is also part of the plan. Thanks. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. Thanks, Anne-Marie. It was Anne -Marie. a bit of a rattle through, but thank you for having me.